the Competitive 40K Network presents Art of War. Strategy and tactics. Discussions with the best players on the planet. And now your host, Tim Penny and the Art of War coaches. Hello and welcome to the Art of War 40K, your podcast for high-level strategy and tactics and detailed list breakdown from the top players around the world. I'm your host, Tim Penny, and I'm joined by my friend and co-host, John Lennon. Welcome, John. Hello, hello. It is good to be back. I'm very excited for this episode. This one has been, uh, well, this one has been earned a while ago, and uh, I'm glad that we're finally getting it done. Same here. I'm, I'm also uh, very excited about this, and we'll tell you why in a little bit. But before we do that, uh, just I know some of you, it's possible uh, might be newcomers to the show and you are not aware who John is. Just give a recap. He was a uh, third in ITC uh, 2019 season. He finished best Space Marines that season. He was best Tyranids in 2017. He has won Crucible 2019, Iron Halo 2020, Dallas Open, Lone Star, and Charity Hammer GT in 2021. And honestly, if he uh, called in his uh, prize support in the state of Florida, I'm pretty sure it would single handedly sink the games industry. So our guest today is Matt Robertson. Welcome aboard, Matt. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me on. Uh, We have Matt on because he has been absolutely crushing it across the pond uh, with Sisters of Battle. And we were excited to get him on because although there's a lot of similarities, in a lot of ways, he's kind of taken a different path than John has with Sisters. He's really been putting up results. Uh, Matt, why don't you walk us through some of the recent events you've won? So there's a couple of little one-dayers, but then... There was the Just Play Games GT in Liverpool, which was 36 players. And I know they're doing a couple of events later this year. Uh, Winehammer in Yorkshire, Hellstorm Gaming, and the SummerSlam up in Newcastle, which was majority T3. Love it. And just to give a little bit of background, uh, I actually reached out to Matt when I noticed that he was putting up some results because I honestly really loved his list. And even though I love John's list too, Matt's list just felt a little more violent and a little bit faster, which is what I was really digging. And actually uh, kind of just last minute pivoted into it at the GW Open recently. And I went uh, six and two. And if you ask me honestly, I think I could have gone seven and one, but I was super tired that one game. And I really have to uh, thank Matt uh, for kind of talking me through how his list worked. Uh, and then just the raw power of the list and the speed was super suited for that uh, that GW GT format where you really couldn't shoot anything further away than like 18 inches. And just having a lot of fast infantry uh, shooting and melee was just it just felt really good. So I don't want to bury the lead too much um, or uh, or spoil it. Matt, why don't you go ahead and run us through your list just top to bottom? Uh, we'll go into the detail of the units later. Just just spit it out and just uh, just tell us top to bottom what you got. Yeah, so it's a Bloody Rose detachment. With Celestine, three inch of Repentia, a Repentia Superior, a Dogmata with uh, two inch of Sacrosants, two inch of five Zephyrim, and five Retributors with two Melters and two Flamers. And that's their Bloody Rose still. Then Argent Shroud with Val, two Crusaders, five Sisters, two inch of five Dominions with four Storm Bolters, two inch of five Retributors with four Multi Melters and Cherubs, and a single Rhino. All right, I love it. Let's start. Uh, let's start diving in and get to the nitty gritty of how this works. Uh, just why don't you tell us? I kind of want to know what came first, like the chicken or the egg. Uh, did you have like a strategy, and then you kind of built a list to support that and support your play style, or was it just kind of like you you like these units, and then you kind of built a play style and plan around it? So I played a lot of sisters like over the past couple of years. Well, less so in the last year with lockdowns and stuff. But before that, when they got the new range, I already, I'd used them. A little bit in the past and then just kind of loved the the style they have so i went okay let's just jump new book straight back in where we left off tried all the units and just the style of the book and all, a lot of the units just really suit the way i like to play the game and so i kind of just picked up where i left off for kind of january march last year with some decent events with them and at first reading the book it was like okay there's a few changes here but then you kind of read it again and go okay, yeah, there's definitely some play here. And just ro- roll with that. Yeah, I, I really love the New Sisters book where it didn't look like a lot changed on the first uh, you know glimpse. It kind of looked like we got a couple tools and then lost advance and charge and that was it. But honestly, the more and more I've played with it, uh, I, I've really come to appreciate all the differences that have sprung up from the last book. And it's led to quite a few different play styles 
uh, from that last codex. Even though the last codex was great, I actually like the uh, the current playstyle more than the old one. Uh, I have to ask, uh, you know, because we, we had some Sisters players who were a little down on the book, uh, especially right when it came out. Uh, new book versus old book. Uh, are you happier with the new one? Oh, yeah. I think all the units that people seem to kind of go, oh, these got nerfed. You go, okay. They, oh, wait. Some of them, I think, actually got better. And just all the little other options, like even just little things like the uh, being able to make you an obsec with a dogmata just gives you so much play and the little tweaks to strats and things just open up so many more possibilities rather than just the blunt force lots of little tech pieces instead yeah this book felt a lot more like the sum of its parts to me than uh than some of the stuff we've seen in the past for sisters so i'm really happy with this one but uh i kind of want to dive a little bit deeper into your list um real quick uh maybe if for someone who isn't uh, as familiar with uh sisters of battle what does this list list generally look like uh on the tabletop so without taking your opponent into effect what is this kind of designed to do? What is it supposed to look like when you play it? Uh, well, hopefully early game, it's not going to look like much because the majority of it's just going to sit and hide. But then it's just a lot of different threats. It's got decent shooting. It's all reliable, reasonable speed with the Argent Shroud options and just a hell of a lot of combat punch to kind of just dominate areas of the board and go, if you want to come in this area, you're going to have to deal with all these threats pushing at you and then just see how people handle that. Yeah, I like it. Um, I can fully endorse that. I love how, uh, you know, sisters are kind of thought of as the smaller power armor army. But when it comes to deploying the army, it can have a lot smaller footprint, especially for targetable units than uh, than a comparable, you know, space marine army would have. And I've really enjoyed that ability to uh, have a very laid back turn one where nothing gets shot at. That's uh, one of my favorite things is not having a shooting phase on turn one for my opponent. Yeah, a lot of the time because they are the little fragile. It's like okay, if you let your opponent shoot them, you're just going to be throwing models away. So like you say, it's just, okay, I'll sit and do nothing, and okay, I'll just wait to see what you do and react to that. And they're really strong with the reasonable speed, but different options to just react easily enough to your opponent, I found in most games. Yeah, I can uh, I can definitely get behind that. Uh, the speed of the army has felt like it's... Hey, you know, sometimes sisters feel like they got a little bit slower, but also it always feels like it's just fast enough, you know, between still keeping some advance in charge, um, you know, it's just there's so many different options for sisters. Honestly, I just love how flexible there is an army. But uh, let's uh, move on into, uh, you know, going into some of the specific things. Um, honestly, I obviously I've been playing sisters uh, quite a lot myself recently. So whenever I look at your list, I always kind of look at it as a comparison. The first one I actually want to talk about is not a unit, but instead uh, Argent Shroud. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, a lot of the events in the UK have ruled that Argent Shroud does work when you get out of a Rhino, is that correct? Yeah, so I know the majority I've been to have, and also the WTC is. I know there's a couple that haven't, but I think they tend to kind of be fewer at the moment. But even if they kind of weren't allowing that, because I'm only running one Rhino rather than multiple, it's not a huge kind of issue I don't find. I normally find turns two, three. Just having that extra speed, extra ability, that extra range just gives you that little bit more threat and just lets you get into places from those little ruins where you hide in. Gives you that little reach or little, you can get around the side or something to get the line of sight. Whereas just a six inch move, potentially it's easier for people to get angles to hide from you. Yeah. Uh, just for any viewer who uh, maybe, uh, you know, missed it, what exactly does Argent Shroud bring to the detachment? So it gives you a reroll hit or wound when they're selected to shoot or fight, which is. A nice bonus but the main strength is they can uh, in the shooting phase uh, count remaining stationary even if they've moved in advanced so that means you can get extra d6 move on everything and the retributors which would be taking a minus one for hit for moving in the new book uh they kind of offsets that perfect yeah it's it's hard to under you know understate how valuable that is especially you know for those of us who played the old book uh when you lost that ability to ignore the uh heavy weapon penalty finding a way to get it back in a, and you know and more uh that, that's super, super valuable. All right. Um, so I uh, I guess uh, just moving down the line here, um, I think, uh, so looking at your list, you've got Morvan Vall, you have uh, St. Celestine, you've got quite a lot of melee from the, the Bloody Rose detachment here. Um, 
You know, I actually, I do actually want to ask another question here, and that is about the uh, the Bloody Rose Retributor unit. You do have a third Retributor un uh, squad in there, but they don't have a Rhino. Have you ever had any trouble with them being a little bit slower, not having a transport, or uh, are they just kind of always making it work? Well, I found a lot of the games when I was running three, uh, you'd probably want to outflank a unit anyway. And since you don't get the remain stationary benefit when you're coming on from reserves, I thought there's no downside really to have that squad in the Bloody Rose detachment because for that turn they come on, they're going to go do all the damage. They normally put themselves in harm's way, so not surviving too long anyway. And the Flamers aren't really as fussy, and the Melters, you're going to be hit on fours either way on that turn. And it you could make them Argent Shroud still by running a heavy support detachment rather than a patrol, but the cost of free command points it's just not really worth what you gain out of it got it okay yeah yeah that actually uh that makes some sense there yeah if you're going to be putting them in reserve uh that makes a lot of sense um speaking of um i again uh, i see that you have three repentious squads and no uh transports for the uh the bloody rose attachment uh does the power level work out where you end up putting multiple units in reserve or do you usually just stick with the one retributor squad uh, a lot of the games it ends up being the Retributors, potentially Crusaders, depending on secondaries, etc., what you want to run for it. There's some matchups where the one Repentia squad may go in, may potentially two, but the majority of the time I've played with them on the board. And then some of the Zephyrim, again, depending on the matchup, will jump into reserve or maybe start on the board for some early game aggro. I think a lot of that kind of depends on the matchup and where things look, where your threats are, what kind of position you need to be for objectives. But mostly the repent here I'm kind of running on the board. I have a question about the uh, the sacrosense. Um, I noticed you have two squads, uh, both bloody rows. And then a lot of times, at least for me, it feels like the sacrosense are kind of like the late game cleanup crew, you know, or they're just kind of standing around just bodyguarding while you start getting more and more aggressive with uh, the positioning of all and Celestine. Have you ever considered... Um, or is there a reason you didn't consider uh, putting one of the sacrosanct units in the Argent Shroud detachment? Because it feels like a lot of times, uh, just especially with um, fast armies that could do mortal wounds, like like great. Well, I don't want to get too much in the matchups, but there are armies out there that can you know potentially get angles and kind of peek at you or try to peek behind your ruin and, and stick mortal wounds on the sacrosanct. And honestly, that that seems like it might be something that's a little bit of a blind spot. Uh, or did you just want the extra melee power of those extra units? Uh, this was mainly for the just the combat punch, because like you say, mid-game, they can just start running up the board once the key threats have gone. And for the points you pay for them, just over 100 points, they can do a fair chunk of damage. Um, so they've done a lot of working games over the last month or so, just from mid to late game, mopping up stuff. And a lot of the events where I've played at the moment, it hasn't been with the new Grey Knights, because it was prior to that codex because uh, I've not played any in the last couple of weeks. Uh, however, I found a lot of the time there's so many little annoying units with sisters, you can kind of just use them to screen and prevent anything getting around, getting the angles on stuff, if you really need to. All right, sounds reasonable to me. Uh, John, uh, honestly, I, I I like his list. There's a lot of very similar parallels to the uh, the Bloody Rose Evan Chalice one. Uh, do you think there's anything else uh, unit-wise that, uh, that kind of jumps out to you that you want to look at, or you want to dive into uh, the next part um i did actually just kind of want to ask um a couple of you know questions on those units um specifically uh, i actually want to go back to those sacrosants so you have two uh sacrosant squads that are each seven girls right yeah so they're each seven in that i think i played around with versions where i had an eight and a seven but i think two sevens was kind of where i, I settled with that mm -hmm. So my actually my main question is going to be on the the weapons that you took. Um, you took anointed halberds on all of these, and these are the um, the bloody rose ones that get the extra AP. Uh, a lot of the uh, you know the general opinion on the internet, for whatever that's worth, seems to be that the bloody rose really benefits from the maces. Uh, I actually haven't taken bloody rose sacrosins very often, so I'm kind of curious. Have you you found that the uh, anointed halberds work better than the maces for bloody rose? Yeah, is there like a reason for that choice? So originally I sat and ran. Run all the numbers, little spreadsheet going, and it worked out. There's several kind of things tipped the halberd over the maces. So I think if you're playing against uh, like Vanguard Vets or something, obviously the maces do come out better, but only by like two models from a full squad, you kill like an extra two. 
but there's a lot of other ways you can kill two wound marines in the list. But anything that's death guard with minus one damage, anything that's ignoring AP one and two, because even with bloody rose you only go to AP two, uh, it gets rid and just goes through all kind of like ad mech little units going, you're hitting on twos, potentially wounded on twos, cutting through with them, ignore modifiers rather than twos and threes, and then they're still getting the better saves. And against the majority of things, it worked out the halberds numbers wise just seemed better. And if marines are super popular, then maces potentially. But like the Repentia are fantastic at killing marines, the two damage storm bosses. There's so many other ways I've not really found I struggle to kill marines with this. Got it. That you know that that does make sense. I could actually uh because the uh I think the strength difference there, the halberds get to strength six, means you wound T three on uh on twos. So I could actually see the you know how the extra AP, especially against you know things that ignore AP, such as uh, Admech. Not that anyone's worrying about that nowadays. Um, I can see how that really adds up and uh, makes a difference. Um, so yeah, I, I don't mind that at all. You know, I, I think what against Dark Eldar and uh, Admech and um, you know, or at least the Rangers, as well as the uh, as well as other sisters' army. I guess the Halberd would uh, end up being a little bit better. Yeah. Okay, e- I can e- see the logic. Even Marines, if they don't have the invuns, like your standard stuff, you go in straight through with your AP4, so it kind of works out very similar against non invun marines or other things like that. Alright, I like choice. it. Alright, let's see here. Well, uh, yeah, that's, I think that's all I have on the units. Um, you've got the classic Celestine and Vol. You know what, honestly, I can't, I can't let a moment go by and not talk about Celestine and Vol. I'm sure a lot of people already know uh, what's so good about them, but you know what, we haven't done a Sisters episode in a, in a month or two. Uh, let's take a moment to focus on the big girls. Um, I, you know, they're obviously both nice, big, beat sick units. They're they're fantastic. But uh, real quick, do you want to just give us a rundown on uh, exactly how you use uh, Vol and Celestine? Yeah, so Celestine tends to be more of a a sweeper kind of unit because she can go 12 inch, she can jump side to side. She's got that little protection from the Saxon bodyguards trailing out, which is a little bit crazy at the moment. But then she can always just go and sit and control a bit of board space, control an objective that you can't really just sacrifice a unit onto and force your opponent into problems with the six inch heroic, the fact she could potentially get back up anyway. And if they want to come in and deal with her, they're coming towards the rest of your army. So whatever they send in has to be decent to deal with her because she's not super squishy. So then whatever they're sending in is probably going to get hit back in return and just kind of using her as a bit of a gatekeeper mid game and then later on she can kind of run off and go aggro if things come too close or gives that little bit of reach with a 12 inch move and Val <laughs> oh sorry I'll let you... no no please I was going to say Val is an interesting one because I keep looking at Val and going okay what would I get if I dropped her like, I could swap her out for get some reroll buffs but I can never bring myself to do it because in every game just having that ability to go right this unit's going to rear off hits and wounds, and I'm just going to send it off to do that thing. It just gives you that reliability, that certainty of when you need to go and kill something, it's just going to happen. And then she's normally a lot of the games kind of chilling out, buffing things, and just going, here's some little shooting, little bits and pieces. But when she does need to go in or go and charge and kill something, she's got her warlord trait for rear all hits and wounds anyway. That makes her super reliable, and she does a good amount of damage. Yeah, I, I, I feel that where sometimes Vol sits in the backfield and you think, you know, what would it look like if I tried to take her out of the list? Uh, I'm right there with you. I have never been able to make myself actually do that. Um, she, she just has so much value at the end of the day here. Um, I think one of the you know biggest things for me has been uh, just having that absolute beat stick waiting around. And then, as you mentioned, the ability to send units off with the buffs is really important because, you know, traditionally sisters kind of operate as a blob. You've got your, you know, your bodyguard rule that you're trying to exploit. You're trying to stay in your buffs. You're trying to be able to defend yourself, you know, have Celestine 6 and Troic to support something. You don't necessarily want to split up the army. So having a tool that lets a unit go off on its own and not lose any efficiency uh, is just absolutely massive. And same thing, you know. 
I think about it sometimes, but end of the day, Vol is still on all my lists and she's not going anywhere for me. Yeah, I think the main strength I found is you don't need to like stay in that range. It's just that you can do it and then just run off on that unit. Like you say, you don't have to try and keep the Cannon S and Palatine up in support. It's just all right, they're going to do their thing. Everything else can sit and just chill and wait and react. Doesn't need to go too crazy. Yeah, that's that's been the best part for sure. All right, well, uh, I kind of want to move on to um, how you like to play the list on the table a little bit. And I actually want to start off by talking about secondaries. So starting off, uh, I guess, do you, in the list, do you kind of have secondaries that you plan on taking every time? Um, do you have a set plan or you just, you know, enjoy being flexible? What do you normally find yourself doing? So I think I've one game so far where I haven't taken a leap of faith. And that was against a knight army where there just wasn't enough units to generate miracle dice. Uh, in I think every other game, maybe one or two others have not. I've taken that secondary, and that's been fantastic. Normally, it goes for engage or stranglehold because it's super efficient at those. Banners or rod, uh, or retrieve various data. It's good at both of those because a lot of time your opponents don't want to come into you, so you can keep your banners kind of safe that way. And then a lot of times there's good mission ones that it, they play into really well just by having the board control and the f- multiple layers of threats on things. Okay, so I'm actually really interested in uh, in your take on Leap of Faith. Uh, I know you said that you're, you're getting great value out of it. I'm actually a little curious here because if I'm being honest with you, I don't think I've ever taken Leap of Faith in a tournament game. I, I don't think I've taken it a single time. Yeah. Um, have you, so I've, I've tried it in practice games, and the problem I ran into, and maybe you've found a way around it, was that it felt like it kind of forced me to use my Miracle Dice early or at a certain pace. And sometimes I would run into a game where um, I wasn't doing anything on a given turn and I didn't want to use any Miracle Dice, or maybe I was confident I could do something without Miracle Dice and I had good Miracle Dice showing, so I didn't want to waste them for no reason. And it always felt awkward that I, I kind of felt like the pace was enforced on me, and I didn't like that aspect of, of the secondary. Uh, have you ever found that to be the case? Has that not been a problem? Uh, what's your take on that? So there's a few like, kind of little things in the list or in games that you can kind of use to mitigate that a little. So I've got the Beacon of Faith, uh, Wall of Threat and Dogmata, which still needs FAQ in, but, but I've just been using it on her, not on her or potentially Val. Uh, and every turn she sits in the back corner surrounded by all her friends and just advances. So it means in my own turn, I only need to use one dice for something else just to get a point. Two dice for, so it's kind of let me use less miracle dice for that. Uh, I'm quite aggressive with Repentia, and I don't mind using them to kind of go and hit key threats, especially the five man squad. So once they, your opponent can't ignore them, and then once they kill them, uh, that gives you more Miracle Dice, which you can kind of use just early game to keep the flow going. Um, I do use Miracle Dice or like twos and threes and etc. They're quite odd things. So there's been times in games where if I've got 20 saves on a little five-man squad, I'll just fail four and then go, okay, I'll choose to fail the next one uh, just to use a Miracle Dice in different phases. Um, it's been really successful. I've had one or two games where my opponents have gone, okay, I'm going to try and not engage you in multiple phases to stop me getting the two or three points in their turn. So rather than shooting, they've just charged and just tried to do damage in that phase. But then as soon as you go, oh, I'll spend one command point overwatch and just throw a random dice in there. And then you do something in the combat phase. It's like, oh, I'm getting two, three points anyway they kind of quickly realize it's not worth trying to fight you only in one phase and get rid of half the damage their army's doing to you. Got it, okay. And um, I take it then that you've always felt like you've had enough Miracle Ice to, uh, I guess, kind of make that strategy work? Yeah, so I've maxed it in every game I've taken it so far. and It's really nice just knowing you're going to have to use a couple of dice for strange things like that, but just being able to play a game and not really have to go out of your way to score like 12 in a secondary just be able to play the normal game and go i'm going to use one for damage here i'm going to use one for a hit roll there or a charge roll here and just get points and be rewarded for 
playing the army the way it wants to be played in general. Okay. All right. I like it. Um, yeah, I've always, um, you know, at least on my take, uh, because I'm doing the Ebon Chalice, I, I've always been discarding a lot of Miracle Dice to uh, make the magic happen, you know? So whenever I, I have it to, uh, you know, I always find a home for it. But I can totally see where, you know, in your case, since you aren't, um, well, you, you aren't doing that, uh, I can really see how that adds up and gives you enough Miracle Ice to play the secondary. Yeah, so I, th- I think with Ebon Chalice, you've got the, those other uses for those kind of not great Miracle Dice. Whereas with this, it's kind of like, yeah, twos, threes, they're not fantastic, but oh well, they're definitely going to do something and get point. Mm-hmm. And because it's in the category of No Mercy, No Respite, where the only other reasonable one for Sisters is the While We Stand, it just lets me be a lot more aggressive with Val and Celestine as well without really having to worry about oh, what if they die, they point. It, you can just go more aggro and put more threats and more pressure on your opponents. Yeah, I can definitely see the appeal of that place, Tal. I, I have felt a little bit tethered sometime, sometimes when I've got 15 points in expensive characters that are sitting behind a wall and I want to go punch someone, but I like scoring secondaries. All right, uh, moving on from, um, from your secondaries, um, I did kind of want to talk to you about the stratagems that you end up using. How many command points does your list uh, start with? Uh, so it starts with eight, but in the majority of games that ends up as seven because a couple of little units are going in reserve. Normally the Bloody Rose Retributors, I think there's been the odd time it's been six, but majority of games it starts off with seven. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you find yourself uh, outflanking their pinch ever, or do you just like having three units uh, on the board where they can advance charge and do annoying things? Uh, so there's been a couple of games where if it's reasonable and direct or mainly the more diagonal ones where I can come in on the long board edge in towards the corners and catch my opponents out where I've outflanked our repentee unit. Mm-hmm. But a lot of the time I like having them on the board just to have that threat and cause problems by being there because I normally have a Zephyrim squad in reserve with the Retributors just for having that little charge threat as well. Yeah, right on. Okay. All right. Um, so as far as your uh, your command point expenditure goes, starting with uh, usually 7-6, um, what stratagems have you found to be the most useful for the New Sisters Codex? Uh, are there any ones that you maybe use more than you thought you would, and you maybe use less than you thought you would as well? Yeah, so I think Bless Bolts is probably the first obvious go-to, which is the main reason the double Dominion squad's in there. That's the doing the mortar wounds on sixes. And thankfully, the events I've been to have FAQ'd. If you roll more than three sixes, they don't all disappear as well. (laughs) Because as it stands, it's just you discard sixes and then do a maximum of six mortals. You know what? I I really hope no one ever uh, tries to tell me that all my sixes disappear. I'd be very sad. Yeah, it's one of those where it's like, there's an obvious thing that just has been overlooked for some reason. Uh, So that's one I'm using most games. Uh, Having the option to do Thrice Blessed Hull has been funny against some of the Psycho Armies I've played more recently. Uh, Just to be able to say to them, yeah, just so you know, if you're within 12 of the Rhino and you fail, then you're going to take a Perils. It just keeps them a little bit honest. Uh, I've never actually used it, but just having the ability there has been interesting to see kind of the focus behind their eyes and their logic trying to work out what's going on. <laughs> uh, yeah, I love that. The smokescreen strat is great. Minus one take on the Rhino. Just when you know they've only got a couple of units they can put in and it might just tip it in your favor to survive. Uh, and then Holy Trinity has been... That's been one where I've used maybe once or twice. Uh, I thought I'd end up using it more, but just a lot of time it's not been really needed because a lot of time with the Flamer Squad coming on from reserve, I have been popping the Cleanse by Fire two command points just to go max Flamer hits. And that's been really reliable, just coming on and making sure that little unit is getting hit and doing the damage I need to on it. Repentia, their fight on death stratagem, has been probably the best stratagem in the book. It just makes them so much stronger, so many more options for them. Uh, and then, kind of like Moment of Grace, Divine Intervention, I tend to keep Command Points sat back to have that as an option. If I need to just leave a character sat somewhere on an objective, it's a nice tool to have. There's so many good stratagems in the Sisters book, like the Celestians plus one to hit is used a lot in games. Yeah, I'd say like, the majority of the stratagems have been used. Just They're probably the ones that get used multiple times in multiple games you know yeah i love the, the fight. oh go ahead take it Sam. Oh, i was gonna say, i was it sound like you were reading my mind i want to take a little second just to talk about the fight on death and then uh, a lot of people were kind of again like we we're talking about we're kind of down in the sisters book and honestly like repentia except for the fact they can't advance charge out of a rhino anymore 
I think we're pen sure better than they've ever been now with uh, easy access to reroll wounds uh, and then the fight on death stuff I used to have to avoid before like uh, like death guard uh, terminator bricks surrounded uh, covered by the foul blight spawn I just pop plus one attack from the preacher uh, reroll wounds and I just go into them uh, and then it makes them I've also found it's been very good especially because you don't you only have the one rhino uh, the GW format what I did a lot and let me know if this is something you did as well. I would just bubble wrap my army uh, against more melee lists and the melee matchups with Repentia uh, behind a behind a solid wall. And if they didn't have indirect, they kind of had an unsolvable problem where I would screen my army with a melee unit that fought on death. And it really, it really uh, between that and then Celestine standing bodyguard objective, a lot of people had a really hard time with interacting with me. Uh, what did you think about that? Is that did you use it defensively and offensively, or let's let's talk more about the fight on death strap? So yeah, pretty much as you say there, just the ability to go, I'm going to use my two Repentia as the front blocks of my army, and you can kind of interweave Sacrosants who can intervene, you can have Celestine sat there intervene as well, and just go, if you come in to multiple places here, wherever you fight, I'm going to go fight on death, and then I'm going to go and interrupt somewhere else, and with Repentia being as damaging as powerful as they are i find most armies just kind of went no i'm, I'm not going in to do that because that's just giving away so many units for not the, getting the points worth out of it and then just having the ability which you never used to to go and fight in two combats in a turn because in the past i'd find with repentia you could go fight somewhere and you'd kill whatever you wanted to but then your opponent could interrupt and your other repentia squad wasn't fantastic because uh, it probably would die they're not super durable the ability now to just go, I've got command points sat here, I can fight on death, either means they won't bother interrupting and your repenter unit lives, or they will just trade. So you're going to have, you able to kill two units in a turn, which is an ability you, you never used to. Yeah, anytime I'm able to get that command point advantage on the opponent where I've got a fight on death, they've got a, an interrupt, and if we just both spend two CP to essentially get to the same spot, now I have more command points than them still. Uh, has been really valuable you know kind of like you said i've noticed some people are a little hesitant to even use it at that point yeah so sometimes when your opponents don't use it and you're like okay i get this for free or they're like, oh, they need those command points or something else you're just burning the resources mm -hmm. and it's just a really good trade yeah especially for the points you pay for the units yeah absolutely i can feel that all right awesome um let's uh let's see how uh what do we want to move on to Tim, did you have any more questions before we kind of talk about the primary game? Uh, no, I honestly, uh, I'm pretty happy with that. I'd say let's, uh, you know, because again, this list feels very aggressive. I really want to hear about how it, how it plays the primary. Yeah, Matt, lay it on us. So uh, you'll probably see with most sisters' armies with Celestine, she's quite clutch at playing the primary because she gives you that option to go set an objective and just be a problem on it. Whereas a lot of the other units you've got in sisters if you're sitting them out on objectives in the open, they're squishy, they're fragile, they're probably not going to survive too long. So what happens early game is I'll end up using the more aggressive shooting elements with just to get out, get position, get onto objectives and do some damage into opponents where possible. If I can get angles on stuff to be hidden, fantastic. And the little squad of dominions that isn't in a rhino is normally really useful for that. Early game, just getting into position mid-board because if you don't need them aggressively, they're still a nice cheap unit you can throw away with a pregame move. But then because it's got three Repentia, double Sacrosant, Zephyrim characters, there's a lot of little trading units. So a lot of time someone will go onto an objective and you'll, if you can hide in positions, and Celestine covers where you can't hide, they'll have to come in with a combat unit, which if you're using Repentia, you're just trading, so they have to come in with potentially two units to take it. And there's just so many little threats you can kind of early game just keep trading those objectives and then you'll get a point where in a lot of games your opponent just doesn't have enough units to just keep throwing forwards especially when you start pushing the sacrosants up mid game or val mid game with them and just kind of going okay the middle of the board you've now got one or two sacrosant squads there you've got val who can all intervene so you can set on objectives and kind of just go yeah come and get them yeah the comp the commentary seems to be that the new sisters codex is just difficult to interact with and if you're especially if you're not prepared for it and you don't know what you're walking into it can be a real challenge to kind of go into that porcupine yeah definitely because when you've got so many little units that all deal so much damage 
it's kind of like okay i can deal with this unit or do i deal with that unit or this one um because the boards are slightly smaller as well now it pushes everything a little bit closer in and a lot of the games with the mid board objectives where you put has to come out and engage into that zone it just kind of helps because they're limited they do have good speed but not crazy they can't go all the way across the board but they can just go at this zone this 20 or so inches reliably yeah i'm going to hit anything that comes in there so it makes it difficult for your opponents to know what they can put and what will survive an objectives for themselves as well especially with the dogmata i've found being able to make unit obsec either it's interesting because of the timing of when it goes off but being able to do it and send something in to deny their primary or if you manage to get uh, close to an objective just at the start of your command phase go oh this objective that was yours oh i'm now obsec so uh, i'll take that off you thank you just gives you lots of little plays to kind of play the objective game yeah that's always a good feeling uh, the dogmata has just been a, a kind of a little surprise mvp honestly just because again it just adds another layer to the onion your opponent has to unravel if they want to try and take you off your objectives all righty um so i think um i think uh kind of the you know this is actually something that we talked about uh, right before the the episode one of the last things that i wanted to talk about was actually how uh, your army feels about terrain is it built for a specific uh terrain format you know a lot of uh events that we've seen now across the world seem to be building towards this format or that format where you know a tournament will be advertised as gw terrain or frontline gaming terrain with player placed or you know wtc terrain uh there's even you know, a couple other formats like made by different manufacturers um is this built to work on any specific terrain type does it work on anything uh is there something you don't want to see uh kind of you know let us know what you're thinking here yeah so the events i've been to with it so far i've done like there's the glass hammer gaming which they have a their own train types like two or three big ruins and a few small maybe a forest or two uh the just play event in liverpool they've gone all out roughly kind of use wtc as an idea for their terrain but not following the formats exactly uh then there's like wtc terrain is reasonably popular over here but the two of the events i've been to used that but kind of trimmed it back a little bit so it wasn't as heavy they had the little l's the big l's a couple of forest craters anything that's just got enough places for you to hide kind of like three little bits at the back and then be able to jump from somewhere into the midfield like i don't like the lgt terrain i don't think that favors any infantry armies at all because the gap between ruins is like safe spots is about 15 16 inches so you can't move from one room to another unless you've got fly or a 12 inch move which sisters have but not on a, the majority of their army so anything where you can kind of go little piece to little piece or there's not excessive gaps between between terrain pieces it's kind of where i found they really shine and like the gw terrain i've played on uh two or three games and that was useful because like you say you've got the big gaps and there's not much line of sight gap in between things you can kind of jump from piece to piece uh, i haven't played any frontline stuff because nowhere in the uk or there's maybe a couple of places in europe do that but i think that's more just a frontline in the states kind of using that style okay yeah that makes sense i, I definitely not surprised to see the frontline one is mostly u.s centric but uh glad to hear that you got some games on the u.s train um yeah i i think that almost every train form that i'm seeing is kind of trending towards what you're saying, where there's less than a 15 to 16 inch gap between all the ruins. So you can kind of cross that gap with melee infantry units. Uh, it sounds like uh, the London GT is the outlier, but uh, since we're actually coming up on that event this weekend, we'll have to see how the results play out there. Yeah, I, th I think that'd be an interesting one, but I don't think armies like Sisters will do very well there. I think you're going to have a lot more firepower-based armies that are doing well at that. But we did play an event using the same style ruins as LGT because uh, one of the guys had loaned a lot of the train off the event there but they kind of went with two boards worth of, of the old style lgt stuff into one board so it had a couple of extra big ruins which and played all the small ones as they're counting as five inch so they're actually obscuring so a lot of the other train is small so doesn't which that's another big factor right on okay 
Uh, Tim, did you have any other questions before we uh, wrap this up and go to part two? No, uh, I was just going to thank Matt for uh, for joining us, and then uh, and then ask Matt. I know you're associated with, uh, uh, with some clubs over there. Is there anything you want to plug before we wrap this up? Yes. Uh, so I did have a friend take the piss out of me last weekend because I have three different club shirts on for three different days at an event. But uh, Northwest England, I run the Northern Warlords. We've got two team events coming up next year, which there's still tickets for the winter one which is 22 teams of four. It's about the sixth year we've done it now. Uh, just play games in Liverpool, Glass Hammer game in. And yeah, and obviously Team England reigning ETC champions, hopefully next year, take it back again. I think that's everyone. There's probably someone I've missed. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and give John a, uh, a minute to unmute his mic so that way he can nail this uh, outro. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll go ahead and <laughs> hit it. Uh, folks, thank you so much for joining us in the Art of War 40K. If you are not a subscriber and you liked what you heard, uh, you can head on over to theartofwar40k.com to gain access to part two of this episode where we're going to dive into faction matchups. And you can also gain access to the War Room uh, where coaches like John, Richard, Nick, uh, Jack break down every faction with weekly clinics, strategy sessions, math clinics, and even stream games, including subscriber requests. I know I was pretty happy to see that um, that Sisters versus Black Templars uh, stream yesterday i've been talking for a long time how i felt that was actually a very 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 hard matchup for sisters uh so it was pretty cool to watch uh, john try to wrestle with that one um until then i'm tim and i'm john we'll see you next time thanks so much guys like what you just listened to check out art of war down under and art of war unbroken on the competitive 40k network the art of war 40k.com 